So let's begin, my dear friends. Welcome, welcome to a uh, really special um, session with one of my favorite people on this planet, Reb uh, Peter Himmelman, the great. We've had the privilege of hosting Peter in person here some years back with his lovely, lovely better half, um, Marie or Mar Maria, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. And we spent the most beautiful Shabbos together and he regaled us with his powers of re recontouring. I'm, I'm not sure if that's a word, but he's a fundamentally a storyteller. And I think that storytelling comes through in his art, in his music, in his spirituality, his wisdom. And he's just an all around incredible mensch and human being and an award-winning author, uh, as we'll talk about soon in a all right, the rabbi just he the rabbi is frozen. Sounds like a like a <laughs> song title, you know, when you get those. Yeah. I maybe I'm start good. in with that. That could be my first uh tune. I'm in Belgravia. The wind was blowing. I have nothing on my mind and nothing that I'm knowing Except the Jews are among the chosen Looks like our rabbi was frozen <laughs> Frozen rabbi Frozen in time Frozen rabbi It's such a crime when I can't hear you talk And I only see you walk and I have to Bark, Cause the rhymes ain't coming in my guitar strumming Talking about the frozen rabbi That's it, the best skills I got so far That's good stuff, man You know what, um, it's incredible You remind me, Peter, of a tremendous moment It was a Saturday night kumzitz And we were having a beautiful, soulful uh, gathering Story, song, and music And you invited one of the young men A yeshiva student who was there to go and grab a tea for you. And I think in the three minutes it took for him to get the tea and come back, you had composed a, tr a beautiful song, um, very evocative, very nuanced, and very soulful about this young man who went off to do you a beautiful mitzvah. And uh, I remember at that moment I said, that's genius, you know? So many people on this earth, you know, talented, very, um, hardworking, they are good at their craft, and they present a very, you know, sort of finished product. But what I saw at that moment, Peter, was your process and how your spontaneity. And I think that's one of your incredible gifts. So let's begin with a few questions and then we'll jump right into some songwriting and hopefully an interactive experience and together we'll write the next big hit uh, here on this beautiful Zoom session. So here we go. So Peter, I wanted to start off with uh, with your name, actually, I know that's a it's a it's a great place to start. You know the joke about the uh, there was a Jewish fellow who was walking around with a friend who was a Chinese individual, and at some point he punches the Chinese fellow in the shoulder, and the guy says, "What is that?" He said, "That's for the Titanic." Excuse me. He says, "That's for Pearl Harbor." He says, "Pearl Harbor? That was the Japanese. I'm Chinese." Anyhow, ten minutes later, the Chinese fellow punches the Jewish fellow in the shoulder. The Jewish guy says, what's that all about? He said, that's for the Titanic. He said, the Titanic? He says, that, that was an iceberg. He said, iceberg, Goldberg, it's all the same. Anyhow, mm -hmm. so Peter Himmelman means the man of, of heaven. In Jewish history, we are named, as you know, after our places of birth, our parents, our professions. But you seem to be named after your aspiration to touch heaven. Tell me a little bit about that name. Where does it come from? Well, you know, I have a uh, cousin. He's my second cousin. He's he's want to tell stories, so he can't really judge if they're all the veracity levels a hundred percent. But what he said, he talked to my my great uncle, which is his grandfather, before he passed away, and he said that our name in Russia, or wherever it was in the Pale of Settlement, there's very few actual Russian Jews, as you know. Um, our real name was Gavuriov, which is a pretty great name too, you know, strength and Gavura. But that was a pretty Jewish name. It's a Hebrew word. Yeah. So in order to avoid conscription, 
if you know anything about your history, which was a you know tragic thing that befell the Jews. They take these young boys and keep them in the horrible Russian army for 25 years. Yes. In order to do that, they had given us a, so the legend is, a very Christian name. Interesting. Himmelman. But whatever name we're given probably is providential. Yeah. And I'm taking that name for all it's worth. So yes. Himmelman, heaven man. Knock, knocking on heaven's door, my friend. That's right. Somebody told me about my Hebrew, my, my other names, Pesach Mordechai. There's a Sephardic Chabad rabbi in Chicago. And he said, uh, Pesach, it means, uh, Pesach, it means transcending, flying, floating. And Mordechai comes from more drawer, the bitter spice in the Ketorah, mm. the bitterness. And that bitterness draws you down to earth. If it wasn't for the bitterness, you would be floating up and nobody would ever find you. And if it wasn't for the heaven, <laughs> you'd be the most depressed person in the world. So those two factors are constantly fighting within me, I believe. You know, Peter, let me add something to that. I know we had a beautiful conversation the other day and I told you about the new book I'm working on, which is about words. So the Hebrew word for bitter is mar. And if you reorganize the letters, it spells rum. Mar means bitter, but rum means elevated, like Roman. Right. So it's, it's actually really built into the root, the etymology, the building block of your identity, because according to Kabbalah, the name is our ID code, our spiritual ID code. In fact, the, he, the, the Hebrew word for soul, neshama, the two middle letters spell shame, which means a name, because it's the name that unlocks the soul. And I came across an amazing midrash that actually says the first thing we're asked when we come up to heaven is, did you live up to your name? I love that, that medrash. It's not consistent. The Talmud as offers another set of questions. But anyhow, there's a lot to talk about. Music, art, wisdom, self-help, songwriting. So let's begin at the beginning. Peter, when was it that you decided you wanted to live a life of, of music, a, a life dedicated to spirit? Well, I mean, uh, I didn't think of it as so spiritual at the time. You know, I was a kid. I started listening to have an older sister. She's six years older than me. So when you're a kid, that's a long time. And she was listening to, you know, a lot of English bands, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, the Animals. Remember that, that band? Does anybody remember that? The House of the Rising Sun. But I was always listening behind her bedroom doors. So it was kind of like a filter. And in the House of the Rising Sun, the organ solo, that alone is the reason I didn't become a doctor. There was something so like, oh my God, I want to be that guy that has that cool hair. Um, and by the way, Nathan, your hair looks amazing, I must say. You know, I'm always alert to it. Having no hair at this point makes me even more alert to hair. I but also have a Hammond organ in my background as well. You have a little what? I have a Hammond organ here as well. So I oh, yeah, I see that. that. Man, that looks good. That's <laughs> nice. You have to play that a bit. Uh, so, you know, I started think. you know, it wasn't like a decision. It just was like a, a giant carrot that was so alluring to me that it is continues to pull me through the years a seductive you know thing that i i i just craved and saw myself doing there's another factor there that i never considered at the time because i started playing music when i was about 12 11 or 12 and just started to hit adolescence i i didn't look at that as the potential fulfillment of a huge mitzvah in Judaism, pru or vu, be fruitful and multiply. Although I did need some peacock feathers, I felt to attract a mate, even at a young age, I had this visceral sense that I had to do something special to be attractive, otherwise I would be ignored. So there was, there was a whole rush of uh, creating progeny and fulfilling mitzvot that I was not cognizant of. I just love the sound of the electric guitar. And, uh, you know, I started a lot of bands. I played music very young. I wrote my first song when I was in 
sixth grade. Wow. Um, I could play that for you if you're yes. ever interested. Yes, we'd love to hear a quick version. Sure. Quick version. Well, we had something in, in sixth grade. I grew up in Minneapolis, a suburb called St. Louis Park. It was actually called St. Jewish Park because of its like 0.2% Jews who were outsized and did all sorts of things. It seemed like everyone was Jewish. So we had something called Drug Prevention Week. And it was in sixth grade, so you're young, you're like 11. And when they told us what would happen if you use drugs, which I don't advocate drug use, I'm just saying, but as a kid, I never wanted to do drugs more in my life. It sounded amazing. You could see dinosaurs. It was literally <laughs> the worst way to word kids off of drugs. So I wrote this song. It's both about sex and drugs. And there's no profanity in it. I'll just explain quickly. He tries advances on a young woman that are too advanced. She breaks up with him. She exits his life. Hence, the song is called Exit. He smokes pot and exits reality. Womp, 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 womp. I love her and she loves me. It's a world of love and it's clear, can't you see? The night was cloudy and the stars were bright. It gave her a terrible fright. You really got it going, but you're moving too fast. Hey, you better slow down or it won't last. The door is open, she's ready to go. It's all over, babe, don't you know? It's exit. That's the first verse. And then the solo. Bum, 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 bum. She's gone, it's over, you're starting to cry. You keep it up and you're gonna die. Your hopes are down and you pick up a J. It ain't gonna help you anyway. You strike a match and you let it burn. And right at that point, I hit the vibrato pedal. You let it burn. Now your mind is ready to turn its exit. And we played that at the sixth grade concert. Nobody had a clue that it was about the subjects that it was about. I live to tell. That's great. Who is your greatest music hero? Your greatest music influence? Well, they, they evolve. My father was a brilliant sort of daring entrepreneur and he got into all these different businesses the first cross-country ski shop in the midwest you'd think with all those norwegians they would have done that the first japanese motorcycles the first security cameras and the first eight track cassettes if anyone remembers what those were um so he brought home all this music for me and a man, Jimi Hendrix, you know, the Beatles, uh, the Rolling Stones, Muddy Waters. So he had no idea what he was bringing me. He mm. just thought, you know, they, they were big sellers. And so what, in your own musical career, because it spanned decades, um, what would you say is your greatest moment? What was your greatest sort of success so far? When you look back on it, what gave you that sense that maybe I've arrived or I'm as close to what I'm looking for? I've, I, I found, you know, as close as you could get to finding what you were looking for. Huh. Man, you set me up for that question, Mendel. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 I don't think I, do, man. Ever, I, I honestly never thought that I arrived um, in any kind of, let's call it a quantitative sense. You know, I've sold X million records or whatever. And I don't, I don't know that a sense of a rival is desirable necessarily. Right. I right. do think, though, that I have, uh, through the years, developed certain skill sets. I've, I've uh, written, you know, hundreds and hundreds of songs. Um, and walking down the street somehow with a, I, I don't always do this and, and it's not like fulfilling or something at, at, at all times, but to, to feel f the fullness of having created this many things that I have seen have brought people value mm -hmm. 
is in itself a form of arrival. I mean, which is none of which compares to being married for 32 years and raising four children. So I understand the hierarchy is inestimably right. distant from the children to the songs, but they are something that is, is fulfilling to me. Well, they're a piece of you. You know, people sometimes, you know, when you write, a, people will ask me, what's your fate? You know, what do you, you know, which book is your favorite? They'll say, you know, it's, how do you sort of measure between, you know, your babies or whatever they'll say. But it, it is a part of you. A song is a part of you. You're taking a part of your experience, your perception, a sentiment that you've arrived at, and you're opening that up to the world. Yeah. So there is a sense of music being a living thing and actually spawning its own uh, it's it's its own its own life, but but if I if you're to hone in on one particular achievement because I think that's a little bit different, what would you say are you most proud of a particular achievement in your musical career? Um, I I mean I don't mean to be like a, a, abstruse here. I I don't really think there has been. Hey, look at that young child. Right. right. Hi, child. I see you. Uh, you know, I think it's more the amalgam. I mean, if I'm, I, I've right. been doing this kind of in the quarantine here in the United States, I've been doing this sort of concert series every Thursday night, which I've been preparing for. So I'm going back to all these old songs and mm -hmm. um, there's wow. some songs that I, I play a lot that are, uh, they're, they're easy to play and they sort of, they right. seem like, wow, that, that was a, well, let me, let me look at it in, in this way. Sometimes somebody will come up to me and say, you know, that song was really helped me get through a rough patch in my life or was right. really moving. And uh, I, I'm sort of a little bit, it's hard to sort of take the compliment in a way, and this sounds sort of odd maybe, but sometimes I feel like I don't have ownership of a lot of these songs. Um, so I can't go, yeah, I'm a great this and that. It's just like, I feel kind of surprised that the song alighted upon me right. as well. I mean, almost like a weird, humble, braggy, humble thing. But I mean, I do feel humbled by it. I feel right. like uh, I was gifted these things. Right. 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 That's fascinating. It being a gift. Right. That's interesting because, the, the, again, the Jewish word for intellectual uh, genius is chacham or chachma, which itself is made of two words, which is the power of what? Or the yeah. power of receiving. It's the power mm -hmm. of clearing out what you think you know and what you've become attached to and making space for the new to arrive. And it's the type of thing. You know, when you talk about an idea, you say, I got it. I think it's not, it's not arbitrary. It's, it's actually very precise. What you're saying is, I got it. It came to me. And I was blessed that it came through me. Here's yeah, an interesting you know, question, P Peter. Um, you know, sometimes you know, I'll, someone will ask me, why do you read the Torah again and again every year in, year out? You know the story, etc. And what I'll say is that it's like, you know, the Torah doesn't change from year to year. We do. And so when we come to it as different people year in, year out, we see different things in it. And it resonates differently with us. It's like reading a book you read as a child, again, 20 years later, Sometimes it's a different book because it's talking to a different person. And my question for you is, do you ever go back and listen to a song you wrote and say either A, wow, where did that come from? Or how did I come to that? And B, do you sometimes see different meaning in your own work, in your own creativity? Well, I'm going to start on the, the back half of your question because I do some teaching of songwriting and facilitation. I also do things with corporations and different people just to try to expand my own mind and hopefully some other people's minds as well. So one of the things that, and, and this can be a metaphor, if you're not a songwriter, you can apply this idea to your own life. And, and I was thinking about the chokhmah, the, the, the wisdom of what, of not knowing, the wisdom mm -hmm. of relinquishing our rational beliefs are organized, our ritualistic behaviors, embracing a sense of not knowing as a form of intelligence and a leaping point for creativity. So as it relates to songwriting, there are certain songwriters, probably most of them, 
um, and especially fledgling songwriters that are, they're working very hard at precision. I can see that they're analyzing, they're working to have something that sounds right, sounds good. And, and what I encourage them to do, and this sounds a little strange perhaps, is to become inured to writing things that are horrible, mm. that are absolutely embarrassing. In other words, there is a, a very important time for intellectualizing and, and analyzing. Mm -hmm. These are very important principles. Otherwise, you know, who's flying the plane and who's doing the heart surgery and who's the actuary or the accountant and who's reading the Torah. These are, but there is another time that's in terms of creating something that's equally important to bypass those analytic and judgmental viewpoints. There's always mm -hmm. time for editing. So I think I had this written somewhere. I was trying to coax this guy into writing things that didn't sound common because everything he did was well organized and he, right. uh, it, it was always like, yes, that's, that, that works, but I'm not feeling it. And worse, I can tell you're not feeling it. Interesting. So we had a, I, I, I had him read some things, just read out of a book. And uh, there's a book I have about the great American Frederick Douglass. It's written by a wonderful teacher. His name is David Blight. He's an incredible writer. And, and I had him just read, or I was just reading. I just put my hand on a page and it said, this was something that Frederick Douglass had written in a speech. The Sable Wing of Night. You know, like, what does that mean to you? You've not heard that phrase. Can you, person, come up with something strange? Mm -hmm. So I gave him this little trick. We could apply, try it right here. If you're, if you're game for it, you have to be, you have to be af not afraid to be horrible. Okay. <laughs> you have to be just willing to, to, to totally suck. Qu quick tangent in the United States military, which I work with occasionally, some top leaders, they have a slogan called embrace the suck. Yeah. Do something that you're terrible at. Something that makes you feel inept and childish because that's what? how you will grow. So if that's you're in, Simon, I'm going to put you up to this first. I'm going to say a line, and you're going to repeat back the next line. So you, you want to rhyme it. I used to do this with my kids. Now, I want the, the trick of it is not to think, but just to react. Let me give okay. you a couple brief ways to think about this. One of the principles of karate is to react. And I'll explain how we normally react when a dog is behind a fence and barks. Our normal reaction for most people is we inhale. That's our startle response. But in some way, the, the overarching conceit of karate, for example, and it applies in many things, is to take that wonderful natural reaction but invert it so it's not a which is useless and turn it into a which is powerful. So I want you to, to think of the first thing that comes to your mind and, and blurt it out and be wrong and be terrible. Simon, I pick you because you look brave. Oh, I have this new beard oil my son was showing me. He goes, it's such a specific marketing tool. It's called Aleph Male. <laughs> for like for Israel, they have a gun strapped over them. It's like this special made out of like olive oil and God knows what. Okay, so you probably found the product. I'm sure they're marketing it to you. Okay. Since I have it, 
the sable wing of night took its flight uh, uh, what did you first say? what was the first thing that you said i just found, took its flight tick take its flight took its flight that's it that's beautiful see typically i've done this dozens and dozens of times the first thing that a person will say is going to be unique because they didn't have time to think of something that would protect him or her mm. the sable wing of night took its flight rally hatrotsa you re are you game i'm i'm game okay I'm just going to make something up here. Let's see. I'm going to be really terrible with this, you know. Good. That will be, that'll be amazing. That's exactly what we want. A little piece of chocolate, a little piece of twine. A little piece of mine. Yeah. That's it. And if you wanted to really stack it up in the same structure, you might have had two things. I know, a little rabbit fur and a little piece of mind. I mean, like, what does that mean? Who cares? It's great. Mitch, is that how you pronounce your name? Are you ready to be bad? It's going to be difficult. It's not. My... All right. If you yeah, let yeah. me jump in here for a second. Is that, is that. So you basically are you suggesting that spontaneity expresses what the a realer part of you than the analytic part of you. And so if you want to get to something that's different or real, um, it should come from this your again, the the part of you that's not prescribed, that's not um, rationally, you know, uh, prescriptive, but the part of you that's just Expressive? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I never quite thought of it like that. It's a pretty good, you know, summation of what this, this is just a little game, a little exercise. But if you wanted to expand it out, you know, we spend, there's, there's so many people, we're all, we're all very rational. You know, I came on at one o'clock, I make sure, you know, we, we do things in an organized fashion. That's how we move through the world. That's how we present ourselves to the world. You know, we definitely, you know, we shower at least once a month. You know, we're, we try to be normal. That's like, a, like a, something that we aspire towards. But here's the secret about people, and don't say this too loud. We spend most of our lives in a very, very disorganized, strange state of mind where we're not sure, we're overridden by fears or hopes or dreams. And then there's the actual dreaming that we do, which comprises sometimes, you know, a third or more of our entire lives. And when you take all that information and consider it as useless or tangential to the life experience, in my opinion, you're kind of wasting a lot of things. You're wasting a lot of resources. Again, this doesn't mean you go around the, the world in rags, like howling at the moon. But to be able as a quote, creative person, and that's a word I, I, I really stumble on a lot. Mm -hmm. What does it even mean, creativity? But we kind of have, a, all have a sense of what that means to be that person you have to be able to go back and forth with some ease and some, uh, you know, talent, if you will, some practice between those two rooms so that you create a doorway that's open between them. Interesting. Um, for many people, getting it wrong is a very scary thing. Hmm. Wow. Do you think this is that's such an interesting insight that you could hear in the songwriting of today a particular cultural shift, one could argue, from perhaps the 60s or 70s, which was quite the contrary, was much more about feeling and spontaneity and expressiveness. 
and a lack of order, perhaps you would say, of, of, a, of, a, of a societal magnitude to a much more, um, you know, in a way, fear-based writing, which is about protecting, which is about, um, which is about precision, accuracy, which is about rational. Is that what you're saying? If I understood you well, correctly, no. I, I I would have to sort of s strongly disagree with that. I think that in all times mm -hmm. there have been all individuals types. who have been more potent more moving, more free. I don't think that the times necessarily okay. define this. There have been, you know, some things from the 60s were just absolutely dreadfully pallid. And there's things now, you know, a lot of it comes from hip hop that it's a, a incredibly imaginative. Mm. If you look at Kanye's stuff, it's like, this guy is on fire. I mean, he may have problems with him as an individual or whatever, but as an artist, it's, he's incredible. Interesting. It's, okay, it's so not, you're saying it's not about the times. It's, it's, it's about not the individual. It's about the individual. There are, you know, there are different phases in an individual's life right. where they sort of have been successful with one thing. So they keep dipping their paintbrush into that thing until it gets very tired. Because that thing, the thing that brings you success, this is another kind of tangential idea, tangent upon tangent. Somebody should be taking track of how many tangents I make. I'll, I'll always try to circle back. But success is a very inhibiting thing. Right. It can be extremely detrimental. Right. Because now the thing that we do know well, and this harkens back to that embrace the suck, that's specifically why the army at the higher levels wants people to do that. It protects us from gaining new information. Right. Our success is not a way of joining the world. It's a, now become a way of protecting us from the world. Right. Yeah, that's powerful. You know, um, Peter, I want to veer off a little bit into it's a different discussion. I just gonna Coming say, from Mitch, that world. Mitch, you're saved by the rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from the world of, uh, I guess, you know, um, rock and roll or whatever you call it, nominated for the Emmy and the Grammy, you know, creating soundtracks for films and TV shows. What brought you into the world of Jewish spirituality, of Torah observance? What brought you into that world which in a certain way, is very structured, at least at face value. It's a world that's, that is prescriptive. It tells you how to tie your shoelaces and what to do when you wake up in the morning, what to eat, what not to eat, and with what you can eat it or not, et cetera, et cetera. It seems like an unnatural progression almost, as if you were coming from the infinite towards or into a system that's much more contained. Um, and so that's a general question, your life story. How yeah, do you, you get know, to I'll, it? I'll start there before I get into kind of the emotional stuff. And these are the, the latter part of what you're talking about. is something I talk to my musician friends, many of whom are not Jewish at all, about Jewish laws in particular. We talk about Tanya. We've talked about mikvah, for example. And a musician who has, who, who is, has developed certain skills, understands very well that the so-called limitations, the so-called dogmatic architectural structures that they've imposed on themselves, those are the only means that we have to advance into something of expression and quote, the infinite. You can't get to the infinite without the, the, the tying of the shoelaces. And for me, that was never a hurdle at all. Not to say that it was difficult, you know, to maneuver at times with record companies and things, which I, right. I did because I, it wasn't hard in a sense. I, I understood what was compelling and right for me. Mm -hmm. But the idea of freedom and structure, you know, why be married to just one woman? Mm -hmm. Why does A have to be tuned like this? Why does it be tuned like, I mean, why does it have to have a certain 
specific uh, quality to it in order to play with other things. It, it's all around you. So it, it, it isn't a great intellectual leap. Got it. Very interesting. And, and as far as, you know, my kind of entree into Judaism, uh, as a kid, maybe like all kids, you know, I was, I had it all figured out. I mean, there was, quote, a God, to use a word that can be off-putting to people. I mean, there was Chokhmah. There was something that was running the show. It wasn't a thing, you know, it just was. And then as I went to Hebrew school and you learn more and more and you just learn about, quote, religion, you start to get the sense, well, this this thing that I had a sense of is not real because they're telling me without necessarily wanting to that this thing is some anthropomorphic projection, some, you know, in its grossest depiction, a, a, a guy in a cloud with a beard. And you start to learn that. And if you're a good Jew and an intelligent person, the first thing you're going to do is start saying, I don't believe in God you're going to reject the, the anthropomorphic, as I've mentioned, depiction of God. That's a first step to finding your way back. So if somebody says there's a great Hasidic quote, I'm sure you know it, you know, the, the, the Rebbe sees the guy smoking on Shabbos. He goes, you know, don't you know it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's Shabbos? And, and the guy goes, yeah, but I don't believe in God. And he, he answers, which I found very, you know, powerful answer. The same God you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. You know, the, right. the assemblage of things that you put together based on your life experience that was this limiting, you were smart to, to not believe in God. So, uh, you know, I went through a thing. My dad got very sick. He died when I was very young, and he was young and strong. And it kind of, you know, a lot of things happen at one time. He died. I moved to New York as a kid. I got a record deal. All of a sudden, I'm sitting on a pile of money. All of a sudden, I got everything that I thought I wanted. My dad had just died like a year before. And I met the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And, and, and like, I, I, I often say I'm the fastest guy they ever got in the cult. <laughs> Literally. I mean, I... I I started keeping kosher and everything so quickly. I put on a tallest cotton, you know, which I wear, you know, and. Uh, what was it? Was it a, like a, it sounds like it was a switch that went on. It was, was no it? switch. It was no switch at all. It wasn't, it was, it was, at least for me, and maybe you've heard this said before, it was returning to something in an organized fashion that uh, felt normative to me, that felt uh, interesting. natural to me. And everything suddenly felt like, yeah, I get it. Now, this is a little thing. I've told this story a lot about Simon Jacobson. Maybe you've had him speak or something. He's a friend of mine. The first night that I met him, uh, I was probably 24, 25. We talked all night. I mean, I'm just sitting there with this bearded Jew and, you know, pretty big guy and hairy. And I'm like, what's the deal with this really good looking wife? I, I don't get the whole picture. And he's got these pictures of the Rebbe everywhere. And it, now it gets to be like midnight and it's one in the morning. It's two. And I'm like, I feel comfortable with him. I'm like, what's the deal with the, these Rebbe pictures? It seems like a cult. He's kind of funny. He, he didn't get defensive at all. He goes, look, this is, to me, it's like a, a, an inspiring grandparent. And so he gives me inspiration. I'm like, I get it. He goes, there's one thing you have to understand about a tzaddik. Did you guys ever hear the term tzaddik? You know, like the colloquial term is like, you know, Mort Berm Blumenberg. He's a tzaddik. He's in, he gave me a deal on a car, you know. But Simon meant like a tzaddik from the Tanya someone for whom there is no sense of self, no desire that isn't innately altruistic, almost unimaginable. On the other hand, there's the, the evil person, 
the inverse, and most of us are in the middle trying to get along. But Simmons says, look, a tzaddik could do anything. I'm listening. And I said, yeah, really? Could he fly? He looks at me and goes, look, I haven't seen anyone flying. Like, he leaves the possibility open. But understand one thing. Walking on the face of the earth or flying 40, 50 feet above it, it's all a miracle. And to a tzaddik, they, they understand, they have cognizance around this miracle. I'm like, I'm in. Two seconds. So I said, is that what Judaism is about? He goes, basically, yes. Seeing the miraculous in the so-called mundane. I'm in. You know, what you said is very beautiful. There's a, there's a piece of Talmud that says, before we're born, each soul in the womb spends time with a personal angel, a concierge, as it were, that teaches them the whole of the Torah only for them to forget it just before being born. And the question is, so why go through all the effort? And the answer I found very moving is so that when you learn a piece of Torah after birth, you don't discover it, you recognize it. It's, right. it's familiar. That's the feeling. That is the feeling. That's the feeling. You knew it all along. It's what I call deja vu. Hmm. And I think yeah. that's something really... I, I, I noticed that, you know life circumstances make it a more propitious experience. If my dad hadn't died, you know, all of a sudden my friends are doing whatever they're doing. I mean, I'm still doing it too, but I'm still like alert to this upheaval. So I'm more sensitive to this, right. this memory perhaps. So you, what, could you, did you ever have a yechidus, a private audience with the Rebbe? You know, I had, it was, it was after he was doing these, you know, regular long things, but on the, uh, it was Erev Shavuos, or Motzi Shavuos, and he was giving out dollars, and kosho bracha, actually, and he gave me a bottle. You know, if you get a bottle of vodka, if you're like a teacher, or you're out in the world, and and all these young Hasidim, like, who's this lump with a, with a bottle? Who's got a bottle? And then I, 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 I had maybe six encounters with him and getting dollars and another couple of bottles. But right after we were married, my wife and I, it was right after the Rebbe's wife, the Shloshim, after she had passed away, that he was meeting privately, mm. with, you know, these couples. And we were among probably four of them. And I spent, you know, 10 minutes. So my friend, who's a keyboard player, my cousin, one of my best friends, I always wanted him to come from New Jersey, where we had moved from Minneapolis, and I was now living in the city, come to, to, to Brooklyn once and just, just check this out. It's, it's interesting. Right. And he never did. And now he asked, like, what, what, is it, what was it like? Right. Now, while I can't use the language as free as I, I once did with him, I will paraphrase and I'll say, imagine you've just done the most shameful thing, whatever that might be, and imagine your feelings of self-loathing and, and despair and hopelessness. He's shaking his head, yeah. Well, a meeting, at least for me, with the Rebbe was was the polar opposite of that experience. Wow. It wow. wasn't magical, mm -hmm. let's say. It wasn't mystical, unless we call a person in general mystical, which they are. Right. Uh, it was an encounter with a, a, an especially developed human being. Mm. You know, Peter, the very first time I came across you, by the way, I don't think I've mentioned this to you, was watching a clip of the Chabad West Coast Telethon where you're playing the guitar, I think, and harmonica alongside uh, Bob Dylan, your, fa your father-in-law. And it's so amazing because I think you start speaking Yiddish. You sang a beautiful song in Yiddish. And uh, it was a special moment for me because, <laughs> you know, to be very candid, this, you know, in our home, that, that, the Chabad telethon was the closest thing we got to entertainment. You know <laughs> what I mean? So, you know, it was really, it was a really moving moment. And there's actually, I just recently came across a talk of Manus Friedman, who was also, if I'm not mistaken, from St. Jewish 
and uh, he, he had a relationship with, with Bob and brought him to the Rebbe. Do you know the details of that story? Or I don't know if you do, are you happy to share? There was a very interesting thing about him coming to a yeah, Fabrengen. I don't know too much about it. I, I heard about it. I, I did think that, uh, that my Schwer had, had always had a lot of respect for Manus Friedman. Yeah, and so the, I'll just share in a moment the story. Something about how he was sitting at a Fabrengen and the Rebbe was, as he would, between talks, would say L'chaim to oh, like everyone in attendance, if that's even possible. But he would look you in the eye and lift the class, and maybe you experienced that yourself. And if I, as I heard the story, um, Bob turns to to uh, to Manis and he says, "The, the Reb is not looking at me." And Manis is like, "Come on! I mean, he looks at everyone, and maybe he just didn't look at see you yet." And he said, "No, no, no! He's making a point not to see me." Uh, anyhow, Manis asked, like, sent a message up to Rabbi Groner, who came back with one word, mm. mikvah, and Manis took that seriously. There was a mikvah around the corner and they went to the mikvah. Again, this is a story I heard. And they come back and then the next interlude, the first thing the Rebbe does is look at him and say, L'chaim. Apparently this was after some, you know, one of his, his sort of spiritual journeys, as it were. So I, I don't know I if you've heard I the story. I can't speak to it. Who knows? <laughs> some of it's lore, some of it's probably real. Who knows? Right, right. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. One thing I came across when I was researching um, positivity bias, and I found this incredible, was the Rebbe encouraged Manus or Rabbi Feller, actually, to be precise, um, to ask Bob to write a song about the seven Noahide laws. I don't think it materialized, but I found that interesting because again, in the Rebbe's worldview, when he saw you, he saw your, I guess, all of you, he saw what you, he was thinking in terms of what you can, how you can be the light you were meant to be and how you can take your craft or your ability and share it. And I think that the Rebbe giving you a bottle is, is actually quite deep. It's his way of saying to you, Peter, you're one of the boys. And not only are you one of the guys, you have something that you can do that no one here can do. You can reach through your music and through your writing and through your unique, powerful light, an audience that's far more diverse and far more universal than the typical uh, Chabad rabbi. And the Rebbe said that himself to a number of uh, artists and thinkers and academics. He basically spelled it out. He said, as a rabbi, I can reach only so many people. You can reach further than that. Peter, I want to ask a few quick questions, just a little rapid fire stuff. If you could have lunch with anyone alive today, who would it be and why? Well, boy, that's a rapid fire question. I'm not prepared for anybody alive. a lot of folks out there probably barack obama really that's interesting why it just comes to mind interesting um and if you could go back in time in jewish history is there someone jewish from history? yeah is there somebody that intrigues you well yeah i mean i want to check out david amelik's harp you know maybe <laughs> to check out what he was doing how he's doing his writing how he got all those women what was the story you know <laughs> Maybe he wrote a song he, like you did. How he chucked that, you know, killed that giant. He's got a lot to tell. I'd be quiet. Right. Fantastic. Let's, if you don't mind, let's jump into for a few minutes, the songwriting itself. What happens? How does it work? How does it work for you? You know, melody first or lyrics. Do you have to have a fully formed idea or sentiment? Or does it come to you through the process? You know, do you know where you want to go before you get started? We once had this great session, as I alluded to earlier, where you talked about the difference between writing from your heart and writing from your mind. Can you share a few quick pointers for us? And maybe if you're happy to, to let's get into some fun stuff. If you could share with us so we could try to do something together with the, yeah, I mean, the precious time we have left together. Having uh, a clear idea is, uh, is a very limiting way to write. And sometimes you have to. Somebody tells you to write a song about the Noahide right. laws. Somebody pays you a bunch of money. Somebody does, you know, whatever. That's one way. And the other thing is, it isn't even a mood. You just, you just do the work. You pick up your guitar and you start to play a couple of chords. And, you know, I don't even know what that sounds like. It sounds kind of, sounds off. 
but if I listen more closely, it's got scariness and prettiness in it. Maybe that'll do something. So if I feel like I want to write a song, if I feel there's a need to write a song, I will sometimes take out my timer on my phone really? and I will okay. say, uh, I'm going to give myself 10 minutes to come up with something, a finished song. Wow. I'll fix it later or 15 minutes or something. I don't, that's when I don't really feel like writing, but I, I, I'd like there to be a song, but I don't really feel like writing. I kind of push these limits on myself. That's fascinating. So now, you're basically, yeah, sorry. It's like creating traps for yourself. The chord is, is I've made this statement. I made that statement. And, and kind of what you're doing is you're taking this infinite possibility. Right. And you're now narrowing it down you're you're creating frames because if you have all the time in the world and all the things in the world to say right they're gonna say it so i wrote a song like just for fun the other day i haven't even looked at it but here's my here's how i write the hieroglyphics wow. i change it around i changed the i to you started with the i voice it's called You Just Phoning It In. I don't even have a melody yet. Sometimes I usually start with playing the guitar. Sometimes I'll start with a thumb. I guess you've learned to look natural. Picked up some tips over the years. You can sublimate your anger. Put a cloak on your deepest fears. You can laugh when you feel like sobbing. Turn your bitter frown into a cheerful grin. But baby, I always know when you just phoned it in. Now, like, I don't know where that even came from. Maybe I heard that cliche. Sometimes cliches are great if you spin them in an unusual way. Right. Um, That's that great. It's That's like, a, like a soul song. You know, I could already see how this would work. You know, it's not a, it's not a deep thing. It's also like fishing. Whatever you come up with, you just take. You don't reject. Mm. You take and take. It's not a time for rejecting. So that's interesting because I think, you know, one of the interviews that, that really affected me most was I read something Alan Dershowitz wrote when he was uh, sort of retiring and he was asked, what's your greatest regret? And he said, my greatest regret um, where it was all of the books I didn't write because I was afraid that they weren't perfect enough, or I was afraid I didn't it's really so true. Yeah. have the authority to speak yet. And he said, I really wish I would have gotten them out. And I, I re it resonated with me and it changed my, my perspective on writing because I, had, I have a number of things that I, I'm waiting to do and I've been waiting to do. And then I just decided I'm going to do them because actually you know, if it's something, if you have something to say, share it and share it right away. You're feeling it. It's important. It talks to the, how many wonderful things, how many wonderful pieces of art and poetry and writing were not created in the name of perfection. Yeah. So and I, I'll, I'll add one more thing to this, which maybe on a personal level, um, how many sentiments are not said? How right. many love notes are not shared? How many letters of encouragement or gratitude are not mailed? You know. You're saying because of perfect, because you're not feeling it fully. Is that what you mean in this metaphor? Because you know, like it's weird, or they're gonna think I'm weird to send this note right now, and maybe they'll get the wrong idea. Uh, it's not the right time. I have more mm. important things to do. Mm. Um, you know, it's, that's interesting. There's a beautiful teaching that I came across, which says that the first time a human being thanked God was when Leah named her son Judah from the word, you know, toda, which means to be thankful. And the question that's asked is, is that really the first time someone thanked God? You have instances of previous biblical personalities offering sacrifices 
out of gratitude and so on. So one, one answer is it was she verbalized it. And there's something powerful about verbalizing oh, things. Yeah, sure. It's actually not easy to do sometimes. But then there's a, one of my favorite ideas, which is, you know, Leah, if you read her story, I mean, someone should write a story. If I was a good songwriter, Peter, I would just go through the Bible and write a, so write a story about Joseph, write a song about Joseph. I'd write a song about Leah. I mean, Leah's got an amazingly sad and moving and inspiring story. All she wanted was a bit of love, right? She was the one who was second best. She was actually, you know, not wanted her whole marital experience, unfortunately. And it's, you, you know, it's not like Jacob wasn't a good guy. He wanted to love her. Of course he did. Yes, of course, there was the, the issue of trust. You know, she violated his trust by allowing him to marry the wrong woman. But Jacob was able to get over that. He wanted to love her, but, he, but I guess he couldn't for whatever reason and whatever that means. But what's really powerful is every child Leah had, she had that child as a means of, of becoming more intimate, becoming more loved. She saw that as, as rise, raising her value, raising her equity in, in Jacob's eyes. And so what we're really being told here is that despite knowing that she would never receive his love, because this was she had four of the, of the tribes, she still said thank you to God, which means she didn't get what she wanted in full, and that didn't stop her from expressing a full-throated thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, all those kinds of, uh, that Dershowitz tale is, is good, you know, and I, 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 don't, I think it's universal. I also think that, that quote, art, um, it's overrated, number one. It's, it's not as superior as the art of beautiful interaction. Hmm. It's second tier. And just hmm. like Torah study, if it doesn't lead to action in, and That's a real so change of consciousness, the art itself, let's compare them, the metaphor, if it doesn't lead to a substan substantial change of heart in the viewer or the listener, it hasn't really achieved anything. And, and what stands at the highest place is just these acts of kindness and generosity that, that take place that are completely unheralded. You know, yeah. <clears throat> millions and millions of these things. We get so hung up on, quote, the artist with a like, hat or whatever and a cool thing. Like, it's easy to be an artist it's much easier to be an artist than to be a father and a husband or hmm. a friend. Wow, Dan, that's, that's powerful. Yeah, I mean, it's... Because it's it so interesting. It doesn't take anything from you to do this stuff. It's, it's, it's like eating a meal. So I, that's, uh, it's interesting because if we created that type of a paradigm shift and if we celebrated good parents and we celebrated good friends and we celebrated, you know, kindness as a value, the highest value. I think society would, you would have what we call trickle down menschlichkeit. You know what I mean? If you want to change the society, change the hierarchy of values. It's hard, you know, what, what that means is, and maybe this is going to be the job of, of an artist, is that the human being, the organism, the responses are about self-protection the native the instinctual aspects of us is to take for ourselves even in loving relationships we are you know this spirit encased in this needy meat sack and in order to overcome the quote meat sack if that's understood by everybody kind of the animalistic nature in all of us, in order to overcome it, it takes the most powerful persuasion or, or sort of intellectual rumination, which I don't think is as powerful as being moved to tears or laughter. Interesting. And hmm. 
Mm, that's very you know, interesting. There's where, there's where you're going, where the art is a delivery system. It is, and I say delivery system only to sort of diminish its, its importance. We're getting into Greek territory when we, when we put art too high on the pedestal. We're getting mm. into some foreign territory for a Jew. Mm. So, I mean, I'm all for it. I live for this stuff, but I mean, like, let's put it in its place. Interesting. Peter, we have, uh, we, I, could, I could sit here and, and hang out with you forever. It's such a joy. And it's just like, it's one big muse. It's a beaut I, I know you, that's the name of your company, but it, it really is, it's like a journey. It, and you don't know what's coming and where it's going. And I love that. We have a few minutes left. Could we put a timer on and try to write a song in 10 minutes? Could we try to suck together? Yeah, I mean, you know, that could be just because we don't have a way to get a full structure. I don't know if we can do it collectively. Right, right. Um, Maybe if you ask some questions, we can all try to answer in the do. chat. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start around the horn. And just, you know, based on what you feel, what you heard today, Nathan, give me the first line. <laughs> Spit it out. No thinking. I don't usually write lyrics. What did you say? I don't usually write lyrics. It's the one Got thing it. I don't do. Okay, That's thanks. a great beginning. That's great. <laughs> That's a good beginning. <laughs> Okay. But, by the way, that really is connected to a lot of what we were saying today. Yeah, for sure. It's great. Okay. Next. I usually write the chords. That could be a second line if it makes sense. Is that what you said? No, that's what I said. Um, let's go. Let's, let's pitch in everybody. Let's suck together. That's okay, part of what it. this is about. I got it. Let's pitch in everybody. Can I go? Yes. But the sunshine t-shirt has inspired me. What did she say? What did you say? Sunshine on your t-shirt has inspired me. But the sunshine on your t-shirt has inspired me. We have from Mendy, my good mate, my good friend, the shout out to my special friend, Rabbi Mendy Lent from Chabad of Nottingham, who brings light and love to Jewish to students on campus. He came up with, but today the rain just came. Oh, I like it. <coughs> okay. Go ahead, Alana. So what, I need to try, I need to find some Come up with a line that comes to mind that's either related or unrelated to what we discussed. Really, no relationship, forget that, just say anything. <laughs> say anything. Um, come back to me, I'm gonna think of something, come back to me. Okay, got it. That's, that's a great line. line. Come back to me, let me think of something. Come back, there you go. <laughs> got it. <laughs> Judith, we're up to you. Right, can you hear me? Yes, of course. All right, okay. I feel very chilled and I don't feel, this is going to sound crass, I need to take a pill. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. That's great. Ooh, uh, let's keep going here. Tomorrow is another day. Tomorrow is another day. That's good. That's great. One more, because I might. it's going to get too unwieldy. Got it. <laughs> okay. Simon, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Don't forget to ask Michelle. Got it. Okay. <laughs> okay, now, now, the, now, now we got to see the magic. Now I have my work cut out for me. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. This will test. This will test it. Better be in tune for this. That's a good line, Peter. It's all good. Oh, I remember I threw my guitar out with my demonstration. A little bit out of tune is always good. Don't be too precious. When you're writing, it's good to have a guitar slightly out of tune so you don't feel like, oh, this is so perfect. Okay. Can you hear that? You can hear that all right? Yes. I don't usually write lyrics. 
So let's pitch in everybody The sunshine on your shirt has inspired me Today the rain just came Today the rain just came Come back to me, let me think a while I think of something I feel chill, I need to take a pill Cause today the rain just came Today the rain just came And Sonia, she's so cute Her sound was on mute She said don't forget tomorrow Is another day That's what she said Sonia is a name Today the rain just came I think Simon dropped that line upon his game Today the rain just came And it's falling down Let's pitch in everybody Tomorrow is another day Get back to me in a while when I got something to say. Ilana, I wanna tell you something you know. When the clouds in the sky, the sun still does glow. Even though today the rain just came. Today the rain just came and the sun is shining on my shirt. Today the rain just came And I ain't gonna let nothing hurt me Cause me is more than me Me is weird All I got to say is I'm feeling free And the rabbi's gonna write a song about the Bible And as far as I know There ain't no legal problems with that You see the copyright issues are null and void with those lyrics, you know he will have toyed Writing something we had enjoyed But today, the rain just came It's the best I could do. Beautiful. That's the art of life, isn't it? Unmuting ourselves. For some people, you have to mute yourself, but sometimes you got to unmute yourself. That's right. Anyhow, um, Peter, that was such a joy to watch you in action we really did something unique. We created something, or rather, you, you know, we gave you what to create with. And I think there's something really special about watching you in progress. There's something so um, alive uh, about watching creativity in operation. So thank you for that, Peter. Thank you for such an illuminating and inspiring conversation. And um, I want to tell you, you know, you said before that sometimes we don't say the thanks, we don't send the letter, and we don't express ourselves. And I want to take this moment to do just that for you, Peter. You know, I think day in, day out, you serve as a light for so many without knowing it through your writings, through your songs, and through your example. And of course, closest to home through your role modeling, Yiddishkeit, in, in, in such an authentic and spiritual and accessible way. So thank you so much, Peter, for being with us today. Um, any last thoughts, any last uh, sentiments you want to share with us before we have to let you go? Yeah, you know, this is something that I do a lot of my uh, sessions with corporations and things. So I won't stick around for it, but uh, I get people to get on their iPhones and even when I talk, I say, look, I want to make sure that you have your iPhone. I'm the only speaker in the world that wants you to keep it on. And if I'm boring, tweet away, you know, all the time. It won't bother me. I just got to step up my game. But, uh, you know, what I would suggest is I suggest to people, and you have sometimes hundreds of people doing it at once, is, is – uh, Take three minutes and send a text to somebody that you love. Tell them about it. Just try doing that right now. See what you get. It's a lot better to get that beautiful text than a kick in the ass. 
and they will wonder what happened. I did this at a big uh, right. theater in Chicago. And about a month after that, a guy wrote to me. He, somebody wrote and found this guy. He said, he wants to get a hold of you. Do you mind? He's like a super successful hedge fund guy. And he said that when he was a kid and even as an adult, he never felt that he was loved or acknowledged by his father. His father was very cold and as much as success as he ever had, mm. he never could get through that wall. And he was fearful that his dad would just die and that would be it. So he wrote, uh, he wrote a little text and uh, he said, Dad, I, I have never really said this, but I, I love you so much. That's all he wrote. He said he went out into the lobby of this auditorium. About 10 minutes later, he gets a call from one of his sisters on the East Coast in the United States. Are you going down in a plane? Number two sister oh writes God. from That's San Francisco. Crazy. Did you just get a terminal illness? diagnosis then about 10 minutes later he said i got a, a text from my dad and he's like he just said uh the, the dad said i i've been so remiss i just never found the words i i'm so proud of you he said i love you so much He goes, everything changed. That's it, simple. It's art, not Greek. No offense to the Greeks, they make a great Slovakia. But that's what I'm talking about. Like he said, our whole family changed. Wow. That's my suggestion. Just a few words. That's yeah, amazing. I do it all the time, like, you know, just people, musicians, you know, like everyone's expecting a kick in the ass, you know, or just like a, or worse, just like a dull, hey, so uh, when did you get here? You know, just like a parv conversation about nothing. You can surprise people. Doesn't have to be skillful. Just, just has to be. Mm. Those are my 10, 10 cents. That's right, I gotta beautiful. Get on. I gotta That's really reverse. beautiful. Please, if you want to find out more about Peter, obviously he's all over the internet, but you're doing concerts every Thursday at what time? Well, it's probably pretty, you know, they're, they're all on my Facebook page. It's uh, okay. uh, 8.30, so, so I don't follow, know what time Please join night. me That's, and let's. Yeah. You find we'll pick it. you up on Friday, Arab Shabbos. Sounds good. Peter, thank you so much. God bless you. Hashem should shower you with, with, with prosperity, serenity, peace of mind, only revealed good. And may God bless you as you bring so much blessing to others. Lots of love. Amen. Amen to that, you guys. Be well, everyone. Thank you.